through your deal and then they thought it was their idea. It's just a simple repetition of the last one to three words of what somebody said. You got the actual recording when Chase Man had back robbery hostage taken. Yeah, man, I mean, know anything about it? Chase, Chase, we chased your driver away. My friend was there. And the bank robber started blowing up stuff. He had no intention of saying people love to be there. They love to be encouraged to go on. These skills help you improve your life. Sometimes people say to me, these tools are just manipulation. It's about win-lose. That is not the case. Great negotiation is about great collaboration. Why does it matter to you? You should get better at negotiation. Because however your life is now, you can do better. I'm Chris Voss, and this is my masterclass.
So what do we need to, you know, cultivate people to do to actually acquire that skill? Curiosity, genuine curiosity. Curiosity is a superpower. It's actually, um, I've been inspired, I, I read a lot of other people's books. I'm inspired by other writers. I see Nicholas Collin wrote the, the Black Swan in 2007, which inspired me to adopt that metaphor as the name of my company. And then I just recently came across a book that he wrote called Anti Fragile. It's a 2012 book. But, you know, the idea is if you're fragile, Something bad happens and you fall apart. You're stressed, you're traumatized. If you're resilient, then you expect bad things to happen and you take it in stride. But then if you're anti-fragile and bad things happen, you get smarter. Talib calls it post-traumatic stress growth. Not disorder, but growth. And then he says curiosity is an anti-fragile characteristic. Like you will take problems in stride and get smarter faster if you're curious. Now, in a black swan group, we teach people to be curious because it's impossible to be angry and curious at the same time. Curious is a positive frame of mind. You're actually interested. There's some really good data out there that says you're 31% smarter in a positive frame of mind. So if you're curious, you're smarter. Now the flip side of that point is, when you're in a negative frame of mind, or you're angry, or you're upset, or you're frustrated, by definition, you're dumber. You're 31% smarter when you're positive, you're 31% dumber when you're negative. So by being curious, you're automatically making yourself smarter. And that's one of the keys to negotiation. Because then you see things that other people don't see, or you see it faster. Any other side likes to deal with you. So share with us a moment. Um, I mean, you've done so many negotiations, but a moment and an example of a scenery of a negotiation where it was more, you know, maybe triggering or more difficult to actually apply the sense of negotiation because your counterpart was maybe not you know, receptive. Well, all right, so, and that's kind of like, uh, what triggers me or do I get triggered? The only thing that really triggers me is I hate being lied to. And unfortunately, if I catch somebody lying to me, that's going to set me off and I'll get angry. And then I can, I can, I can feel myself get dumb. I mean, literally. And, but since I'm angry, I don't care. It's, a, it's this crazy downward spiral. You know, when, uh, there's a saying, if you, if you make a speech when you're angry, it's the greatest speech you'll ever regret. Because it feels so good in the moment. But you say dumb things. So I, if, if I catch somebody lying to me, unfortunately I find that insulting and I get more angry. There was a negotiation probably about six years ago. We were doing business with a company where the person on the other side was just deceiving. And Overall, the advantage to be in a business relationship at the moment was good for the company at the time. There was a number of reasons for doing it. So even, you know, there's no problem with doing business with somebody you don't like. Just understand it's not going to last. And if your strategic decisions for that in the moment are good, then make, make that decision. But this person was lying to me, and I was, I was rehearsing for the negotiation in my head and trying to remember the right skills, and I just I just couldn't do it in my preparation. I just couldn't do it because I was getting angry every time. And then I thought my, to myself, you know, the only reason this company wants to do business with us is because we're really good at what we do. I mean, they're gonna get better, they're gonna make a lot of money. So actually, I'm lucky to be in this conversation because I'm only here because we're that good. And as soon as I switched from a negative to a positive frame of mind, I thought of the things that I needed to, to say and to have a successful negotiation. And I caught myself doing it wrong because I'm human. And you're gonna do this wrong because you're human. So whatever sets you off, you know, what's the phrase? Life is happening for me, not to me. Or I'm grateful to be here. Or I'm doing this because I'm successful. Whatever phrase that can put you in a positive frame of mind will be what you need in the moment when you get 
Yeah. Sure. Here's the mic instead. Yeah, because I'm also thinking that sort of requires a lot of inner work, also that we spoke about, that, that you know, we as human nature might not have had the tendency to do as much, because you need to be aware of your own feelings, of your own body language, of your own tonality, tone of voice, and so forth. So let's share with us a bit, you know, the, the insights to body language, to tone of voice, and what that sort of what the implications are in utilizing that in negotiation, whether it's hostages or in, in your company or in your family and so forth. All right, so uh, your tone of voice. What tone of voice do you use to start with? I know you guys have never heard of this, so I'll mention it for the first time. The late night FM DJ. But that downward reflecting voice, here's, here's the only real difference between hostage negotiation and business negotiation. Hostage negotiation with terrorists and criminals is calmer. Give that some thought. Like almost no hostage negotiator that I ever worked with, no matter what country they were in. By the way, every hostage negotiation team on earth, whether they're in Baghdad, Bogota, Tokyo, Cape Town, all use the same skills. Because we're all human beings. But every hostage negotiator is taught to use that calming, soothing voice. Business negotiators are not taught that. I don't know any hostage negotiator that got into such a shouting match in a hostage negotiation that people were hanging up the phone or walking away from the table. That happens to business people all the time. Think about that, that's insane. Hostage negotiations are calm. Only because if a hostage negotiator only learns one thing, it's that calming, soothing tone of voice. Because it's a neuroscience reaction. If I use that, if you hear that tone of voice, you automatically calm down. It's not a psychological choice. It doesn't matter what your type, you know, whether you're bipolar or you know the terms that they use for people around the world that change constantly. It works because your brain works on neurochemicals, and it's a neurochemical reaction. So I can calm you down. Now you could you could fight it and you could get angry again. But I'll just use the calm and soothing tone of voice again. We use that in our company all the time. If there's a term that we're just not gonna change. For example, we don't in, in, in the United States the clause work for hire. In in American um, legalese is a really bad clause. If I do work for hire, you own the intellectual property in, in, in American contracts. So we don't allow those in the contracts. And, it, and people are always putting it in. And so when we get them on the phone, they simply say, we don't do work for hire. And they say, oh, okay. We'll take it out. Now I could say, we don't do work for hire. And they're gonna say, well, we have to have that in. And then me and Arnie, my voice would set them on. But when you say it in this calming, soothing way, people just, they don't feel forced into a corner. They feel like it's their choice whether or not to accept it. But you're also saying to them in a way that they can hear, take it out or we don't have a deal. It's that simple. And they don't feel attacked or cornered by it. And the chances that they'll just take it out are extremely high. So that's your tone of voice. Now, what else can you do to help? When you're talking, you just, you just smile. And you can feel that. That's another neurochemical reaction. Both of us got smarter in that moment because you're 31% smarter in a positive frame of mind. And even if we're on the phone, you can hear the smile in my voice. Or if you see me and I smile at you. And you can sit there and go, I'm not smiling. But that means you still started to in your head. I run into somebody who's really unhappy I say, you know, stand in line. You know, get back in line. 
I go, okay. And they'll begin to change in the moment. So that's how you start to set, set, literally set the tone in the negotiations for the other side's point of view. Now the late night FM DJ voice. When I'm upset, and you're upset, I'll start to use it because it also calms me down. Like if I can't do the gratitude thing in a moment, if I just switch to the late night FM DJ voice, it also calms me down. So we switch back and forth in our negotiations, principally between those two voices. Now the third voice, the assertive voice. I'm a natural born assertive. That's bad in a tone of voice. It's always counterproductive. And the only thing that I've ever done that's not genuine is if I go with my genuine tone of voice, I once had another hostage negotiator say to me, dealing with you, it's like getting hit in the face with a brick. Well, that doesn't help me. So that's the only thing I avoid doing that I have a natural inclination to do. It's like, it's, you're gonna feel hit in the face. And I think I'm just being honest. A third of the people in this room are assertives. A third of these people in this room are analysts, highly analytical, data-driven. A third of you are very relationship-oriented. The most important thing to you is that we maintain a great relationship. The world splits evenly into thirds. I gave you all three voices. Learn from what you do that's good and add in the stuff that other people do and you'll raise the level of your game. I thought I would seize that moment to see if is there anyone in the audience who has a question at this moment? Seize the opportunity. Yes, there we have one. I wanted to ask you, when I first started a negotiation, like here you have a lot of entrepreneurs and uh, startups, we usually have the negotiation started even before the negotiation starts. So when you start pitching the idea and you want first to involve the, the, the investors, and then you, you know that you have to negotiate to get your better terms, when you will use the DJ FM voice in that process? You will use from the very beginning to build attention or only when it's needed down the road? Um, great question. I'll start out with the smiling voice, the friendly voice. I mean, I, I'm going to open your mind. If I put you in a better mood, I'm gonna, you're going to be smart. You're going to be more open to listen. That's going to give me a tactical advantage from the very beginning. So I'll start by smiling. And then if, if there's something that's a potential sticking point, then I'll go to the late night of the DJ. But I'll start out by intentionally smiling. Now, when you're really good, we have one member of our team. His name is Troy Smith. Uh, great big African-American dude. I mean, like, he's a big guy. And he has developed the perfect blend of both voices. And people love him. Like, he's got this downward inflecting voice, and there's always a smile on his face. Like, globally, people love him. He's about, he's not quite 6'5" very dark-skinned black guy from Texas who wears a cowboy hat that makes him look eight feet tall, like you see him a thousand yards away. And he's the kind of guy that he's so big, he knows that it'll automatically intimidate people unless he's super friendly. And he's the most likable guy on our team. People, people love him wherever he goes. And he combines both those, both those voices at the same time. We have one more question there. Branded three personalities, uh, analytical relationship, assertive as that you mentioned. How do you adapt your communication style to each or do you use just one approach or is it just kind of a takeaway? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and a couple of background and then a really shameless commercial. You're completely selfish and shameless right now. Subscribe to the newsletter. Go to our website, blackswanltd.com. I was talking to a gentleman a little, just before we stepped out, he said, wow, you know, I was on your website, there's so much there, there's so much there, I don't know where to start. The newsletter helps you navigate the website, it's free, it's a good price. When I was at the FBI, I had a friend of mine that used to like to say, if it's free, I'll take three. That also happens to be my favorite kind of food. 
free. My favorite lunch. Newsletter's free, it'll help you navigate everything. BlackSwanLTD.com. Now, the three types. Some, those of you in a room that are analytical have already wondered what are the percentage, percentages across the world. Across the world, it splits up evenly into each of the three types. Certain rooms will lean a little more in one direction or another, but it's, it's a human response. We've taught literally everywhere in the world, and we've polled everywhere in the world, and seen no difference. From China to India to South America. So if the world splits up evenly into thirds, and you're doing the numbers, then two out of three people you deal with will not be your type. Two out of three times. Now, his question, how do you adapt to that? Also, in polling all three types across the world, we split them into groups and we have them talk about how to communicate good with you. And we always ask the question, what skills for the black swan skill set do you want to have someone use on you to make a great deal with you in all three types, like labels and moves. And they list them in the top two or two of the top three every single time. So if you learn labels and mirrors off of our skill set, you will always be able to deal with someone in a way that makes them want to deal with you. Then you learn the other skills as needed for the moment. But start out with labels and mirrors. What's a label? You just say it seems like, it sounds like. You're sitting down with somebody and you can, sell, you can say that, see from the look on their face, they're not happy with what you're saying. And you'll say, seems like there's something I'm saying that bothers you. And they'll like that and they'll answer it. And that's the way you use labels. So labels and mirrors, regardless of type, when you have an impasse, it's probably going to be due to type mismatch, not actual disagreement, but the two of you misunderstand each other. So you use labels and mirrors to figure it out. Just to follow up on that, you said labels and mirrors among the top three. What is it? So what are the top three? Uh, and then when it comes, so just to your last when it comes to the mismatch, do you recognize, do you label it as, okay, this condition is not working, it should, so do you label it and then kind of DR, or do you switch your approach, how do you deal with that mismatch when it happens? Sorry. All right, so, um, the top three. Assertives loved to be asked what and how questions. Because assertives love to tell people what to do, or how to do it. So they really love that. It makes them feel really smart. It makes them feel in charge. I mean, I love being asked, what should I do? I like that. It makes me happy. I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to serve. Analysts, their favorite skill? Silence. We call it dynamic silence. Depending upon how long you go silent. It could be one second. It could be 20 seconds. 20 seconds kind of seem like an eternity. Analysts love to think and analyze stuff. Analysts hate to be asked questions. Actually, what they hate is to answer questions. I know analysts that say, never answer a question sooner than 36 hours. So you start asking the analysts questions, they're like, they don't want to answer. They want to think through all the possibilities and get back to you the next day. So you want to avoid asking analysts questions at all. Use labels. They love to respond to labels. Accommodators, relationship-oriented people, they probably like labels, labels, labels. They love labels, they love the interaction, they love the pleasant nature of the interaction. They're gonna wanna talk, they're gonna wanna hear you talk. They're gonna wanna talk, they're gonna wanna hear you talk. And there's this great turn-taking operation where we have a wonderful time and we never get anything done. But people love dealing with analysts and so they make a lot of deals. Or, uh, uh, accommodators, people love dealing with accommodators. Accommodators make a lot of deals, they're usually kind of sloppy, not very detail-oriented, 
because they think, wow, you know, we like each other, so it'll work out. Yeah, I was actually going to ask which of these three personalities or traits are, are more prone to being sort of a successful negotiator. Well, each one, each type will say they're the most successful negotiator, and the other two types are idiots. So, but there's aspects to each type that are essential. Like the accommodators are really likable. Now, the analysts and the assertors are not terribly likable, and they're really annoyed by the accommodators, but they see how many more deals the accommodators get. The deal velocity with an accommodator is higher. So the analysts and assertives have a tendency to learn to adapt that style. Like my daughter-in-law is an analyst. And she's another another term for analyst is assassin. Like she she could be cold, she could be a cold-hearted assassin. She would like snipe you with a sniper rifle from a thousand yards away and be satisfied that you never knew what hit you. But everybody thinks she's an accommodator because she's so pleasant and fun to deal with. And she laughs and she giggles and she talks about what she's excited about. And people get really happy and then they give her what she wants because she's so much fun to deal with. She's really smart and she saw how, what a strategic advantage that was. Now the assertives, you need to be assertive because otherwise, you're making the other side guess what you want. And guesswork does not make for good deals. So you just need to do it in a nice way. So you need to be assertive, you just need to be nicer about it. Now the analysts, they think stuff through. And you need to think things through. You need to think through the details. You need to think through your answers. You need to think through the possibilities. So each type has a natural ability that's critical. They just need the complementary skills from the other two types to make more deals. Interesting. I guess we, we can all be a touch of, of each, but, but you're more dominant. I wanted to transition also talk about tactical empathy because I really find that that's you know such an imperative ingredient in negotiation, but also imperative in our whole way of communicating. If that was something we would cultivate more, so tell us a bit about that and what does it you know hands on? What, what does it imply? Yeah, well, let's break it down. Uh, empathy to start with. Empathy is not sympathy. Empathy is not agreement. Empathy is not compassion. Um, uh, chapter that we recommend everybody read about empathy. A guy named Bob Manukin used to be the head of the program on negotiation at Harvard, wrote a book called Beyond Winning, which is primarily for lawyers. The second chapter in that book is the, entitled The Tension Between Empathy and Assertiveness. And it's a great chapter on empathy. And Manukin says empathy is not about liking the other side or agreeing with them. It's just about being able to state their position. So take empathy back from sympathy or agreement and let it just be being able to say what the other side thinks and feels without agreement. It's not sympathy. It's not compassion. Stephen Cocker wrote a book called The Rise of Superman, which is about performance. It's about the mindset of flow. He also wrote another good book called Steel and Fire, also about flow. If you want to get better, higher performing human being, you read Kappa's stuff to understand flow. is very much into empathy. He's a friend of mine, he's a colleague, he's a great writer, he's a very interesting guy. He says, empathy is about the transmission of information. Compassion is the reaction to the transmission. But again, empathy is very neutral. Just simply being able to state how the other side sees it. Seeing how they see it is not enough. You've got to state how they see it. To demonstrate that you understand their perspective. And be open to correction. Now tactical. Calibrated application of people's words. What's it calibrated by? It's calibrated by neuroscience. Every one of you in this room, regardless of gender, ethnicity, religion, 
diet. By the way, tactical empathy is so effective, it even works with vegans. Not if you can influence a vegan, that's some powerful stuff, right? All right, so neuroscience, because you're a human being, you're wired to be pessimistic. Survival mode is negative thinking. The negative caveman survived. The optimistic caveman got eaten by the saber-toothed tiger and doesn't have any descendants. The negative caveman said, I'm staying away from it, I don't care what you say, he or she survived. So you wake up in survival mode. That's not success mode. Success mode is optimistic. So since I know that you're probably in survival mode, that your guard is probably up to start with, that you're probably concerned about me being greedy or selfish or assertive, I know that's from the very beginning, so I'll, I'll smile when I speak to start to get you out of that. But now what I'm really gonna do is articulate your fears and your concerns. That's not gonna seem like it's gonna do me any good, but there's been neuroscience experiment after neuroscience experiment where they put people in a negative frame of mind and then they have a device on them called an fMRI which watches electricity go through their brain. And they show them a picture it puts them in a negative mind frame. It doesn't matter what the pictures are. It could be a homeless person. It could be a puppy in the rain. It could be a baby seal on a beach. It doesn't matter what it is. They show them a picture and they put them in a negative frame of mind and they watch their brain light up in certain areas. And then they simply say to them, identify your feeling. Label it. And every time the person simply put a label on the negative feeling, every time, the electrical activity in that part of the brain diminished. Now it diminishes by varying degrees, but this works every single time. So if we're in a negotiation, and you're going to think my price is high, I'm going to start out by saying, you're going to think my price is high. Because that's going to open your mind to the possibility of my price from the very beginning. If I say, I don't want you to think my price is high, your reaction is going to be like, oh my God, it's crazy. It's nuts. I don't even want to know. I'm, you're already telling me it's too high. And if I give you my price without either statement, as soon as I give it to you, you're going to want to make it less. But our coaching fees are very high. If you want to be coached by us, we're going to cost you more money than anybody else's. More than you've ever paid. I'm sitting about two or three years ago with a guy who's telling me about he's got a $9 million in play on the deal. So if nine million was in play, it was for a lot more than that. At the time, I'm only charging $1,500 per session. We charge more than that. And I'm thinking to myself, I'll coach this guy for an hour, cost him $1,500, he's got nine million dollars in play. Logically, that's the cheapest money he's ever gonna spend. So he looks at me and he says, how much is your, is your coach? I don't bother to say it's high. I just goes, $1,500. He goes, ah, it's too much. I'm like, Are you out of your mind? You got $9 million in play here. And you're worried about $1,500? And I said to myself, that is the last time I'm ever going to let that happen. The other side is always going to think your price is high. Don't deny it. Let them feel that way and decide whether or not they want to proceed. When people are forewarned, they're forearmed be shocked at how open people are if they've been given warning ahead of time that bad news is coming. It sort of also puts to point, I mean, the importance of, of communication, narrative, and language. I, I mean, it really is, 
and I think in the way we live today, we're, we're, we're sort of speaking out, we're not really reflecting. But whereas when you talk about negotiation, which we then talk about to adapt both in our private and professional lives, it really is starting to, you know, be an active listener to your own thoughts. Because I presume if you mention, you know, a smile or, 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 or label, but it has to come from a sense of an intention of wanting to do that, or it might have an opposite effect. Or if someone smiles, we sort of feel that the smile isn't really genuinely there, it's more a tactic. Is that when logic overthrows um, empathy? You threw a lot of good stuff into that question. So I'm trying to decide, there's so many gems in there, I'm trying to decide which one to go with. Well, so I'll start, uh, we'll talk about the smile um, potentially being disingenuous. So, when the smile doesn't line up with the body language or the words. Now there's, there's a ratio out there that practitioners such as myself believe in called 738.55. Some of you already know that adds up to 100. That your tone of voice, your words carry 7% of the message. The tone of voice carries 38% of the message. The body language carries 55% of the message. That adds up to 100% of the message. Now, regardless of what the numbers are, when the numbers are out of line, that bothers us. And that's when a smile doesn't add up to the words or doesn't add up to the body language. So regardless of what the ratio is, the real issue is, are these things out of line? If, if I say, look, you know, I'm not trying to take your money. Well, first of all, it was a denial. Secondly, it was a smile. It's not adding up to the words. You're going to get a bad feeling on that. Your ability to pick up the misalignment is very high if you listen to your gut and not your head. One of the speakers on the panel before us used the phrase, be bold. Many of you know all sorts of phrases in the history of your culture, wherever you come from, fortune favors the brave, and various versions of that. Fortune favors the bold. It's an encouragement to be bold. Why do you need that? Because your amygdala, which is negative, in survival mode, is encouraging you to be fearful, to be cautious, to step back. And the whole phrase, be bold, is designed to deactivate your amygdala so now you can listen to your gut and make much smarter moves. Because your gut is very, very, very smart. And your amygdala is not, it's stupid. So you want to listen to your gut instead of your feelings. That's sort of listening to your intuition. It's exactly what that is. Well said. So, with all your knowledge, and especially in negotiation, how do we cultivate our intuition, both as leaders and human beings? Because I think, you know, also in this world, we're sort of losing connection with that, with, with our intuition, because our mind is so quick to actually react. So, so how is there any um, skill set, or is there any, you know, state that we can put ourselves in to sort of remind ourselves or come more into connection with it? Yeah, um, your intuition is, is, can get good really quick if you exercise it, if you, if you take chances, if you're willing to be wrong. The biggest thing is people are afraid to be wrong. So you, you want to articulate what's in your gut, but your amygdala is saying, ah, it's wrong, uh, you know, they're not going to agree. Your amygdala will stop you. Well, go ahead and articulate what's in your gut in what we call small stakes interactions. Like, when you get out of here, and if you go get a cup of coffee, or the next time you get a cup of coffee, take a look at the person that's serving you. Ask your gut instinct, what do you think, how do you think they're doing in the moment? Instead of saying, how are you doing? Just go ahead and take a guess at how they're doing. You look stressed. You look happy. You look like it's been a long day. You look like you don't really care about being here. That's the practice to build your intuition. Now either you're gonna guess right, which will make it really happy, or they'll correct you, and you just got smart. And they're not gonna correct you in an angry way. 
you're actually going to appreciate the fact that you're trying to see him as a human being. And you're not giving him the same line that everybody else walks, hey, how are you today? Give me my coffee. You know, people don't ask how are you today because they really want to know. But take a guess on how they are. And be willing to be wrong. Because then you can turn around and get it right. I'm going to an, air, an American airport the other day. TSA guys, guys and gals in the airports, they're always in a bad mood. Because they're getting yelled at by everybody, it's a very difficult job. And half the time, I got a bottle, a Foss water bottle, with water in it, which means I don't want to throw that bottle away. They're going to take it away from me. So I'm constantly talking to these guys, trying to get out of there without getting kicked out of the airport. So I get all the way through TSA. This is one of the few times that I don't have a problem. And I realize I haven't taken you know, a, what we call a cold read, or just a label of anybody, and I need to practice. So the guy at the end of the line, just as I'm coming out, he looks indifferent, but since so many of them are in a bad mood, I, my favorite go-to line is tough day. And so I look at him, I go, tough day? And he goes, no. And I go, just another day, right? And he goes, yeah, yeah exactly, and he brightened right up. So be willing to be wrong and be corrected and you'll get better every time you try. And it sort of also reminds me of something that you also say and, and that is, you know, human, uh, the basis of humanity is that we all want to be seen and heard because by being seen and heard we're also validated in a sense. Yeah. I just wanted to also give, of course, the, the audience an opportunity to ask questions. So here we have one who is also with us earlier today. Can we give the mic, please? Oh, there we are. Okay. So the mic will come to you shortly. We'll take you there. You welcome it, you don't control it. Because the improbable is always going to make you smart. The improbable is difficult to predict. It's difficult to understand. The whole point of what, what Talon was talking about in the first book, and, and point of fact, in many of his books. But that's new information that makes you smarter. So, one of the commodities you're after in a negotiation is information. You, you, if that may be the only commodity you're after. And the other side is always going to have information that you can't encounter or you couldn't figure out or you can get from them faster than you could if you researched them. The analysts are going to want to spend two months in research so they don't get caught off guard at the table and get the same amount of information that they could have got in 20 minutes of conversation. So do less research and look to use the interaction as a research tool and look for the improbable stuff in the interaction. It's going to save you time. Uh, uh, hi, it's just uh, about the concept of uh, making the pipe versus uh, the title of your book. You know, really the difference. Are these mutually exclusive or can you just make the pipe bigger and take most of it? How is that? Yeah, that's a great question because a lot of people are really concerned if I take the time to make the pie bigger, shouldn't I get more of it? That just seems fair. The F word, right? The F, the F word in negotiation. You know what the F word is? Fair. So I'll give you an example. Um, my former boss, Gary Nestor, head of the crisis negotiation unit, a mentor, a guy I learned a lot from. He leaves the FBI. He writes a book called Stalling for Time, which is largely about his career. More so on his career than my books. My book's about negotiation. Gary wrote the book by himself, got 100% of the book proceeds, didn't pay a co-writer, got 100% of the advantage. He got 100%. Now, I, wrote, I write my book with Tal Raz and my son. My son's an accredited author. But Tal Raz is a genius writer. Read any business book that Tal Raz has written. He's the best business writer 
book writer, business book alive. I wouldn't read a children's book that he wrote, but I'd read a business book. Tall took 45%. So I only got 55%. My 55%, a smaller piece of the pie, is worth more than quadruple than what Gary got getting 100%. So you'll be seduced that if you make the pie bigger, you should have a bigger piece. Depends upon what the net value is. My 55% far exceeds Gary's 100%. Which is a difficult decision to come to until you go through it all the way. So don't be worried about a bigger piece of the pie. Be worried about where you take home is. Hello. Hi. You can hear me now. Okay, uh, I'm trying to be assertive and direct about what I'm asking because it's not a question, it's just an ask. So I'm trying to be direct to ask it and at the same time it took me a while from the beginning of the speech until now. So can I get your business card? And uh, if so, it will be just to be used just once. I'm very, very, very expensive. <laughs> no, you know what? And, but it, like, if you want to gauge a black swan team, we coach people through live negotiations. A lot of people come to us for negotiation coaching in a, in a deal that they're having trouble with. Typically, if they come to us, they've been struggling with the deal for anywhere from six to 18 months. I don't know that we've ever taken more than two weeks to get somebody to a conclusion. And they spun a whiz for 18 months. Frequently, they continue with us because negotiation is a perishable skill. And you, you, you need, intuition is perishable. People's smarts are perishable. We got a lot of free stuff on the website. Depending upon how much you have at stake, Learn as much as you can based on our free stuff. And you need a finer point on something. And if you have enough at stake that we can make a difference for you, then pass. But if you could have learned it for free off of our website, you gather up our free information, start there. Get as far as you can with the stuff that we give away. Because we want I want you to be in a position to pay me a lot of money. And I may need to help you for free of stuff on our website in the interim. So take advantage of that. I'm on the I'm on the I'm on the sorry. But I put you into if I ask you two questions. Okay, so Tim is case of uh flip philanthropy. I don't know why that microphone is killing you, but it's really giving you a hard time. Can we have another mic, please? Yes? You, you're not Ukrainian, are you? It could be the Russians interfering with the microphone. If you're Ukrainian, they don't, they don't want us to hear you. So, uh, Sorry? So, uh, how much trouble would I have to ask you? The first one is, uh, are there any other ways to reflect technical empathy? Because when you are in negotiation, sometimes you're using feels like, seems like, looks like, sounds like. It sounds repetitive. So are there any other ways to reflect the same concept? And the second question is, uh, what are the basis of uh, having or of creating the thought-shaping questions? Is it no ridiculous? Keeping that concept in mind? OK, so the first part, um, the labels come off as repetitive. They might to you. Now, if you're labeling, the other person is going to talk a lot and they're not going to notice. There's also an issue of 
their expectations of you. And example, you know, how do you change your life? My early days on a suicide hotline, somebody's calling a hotline, they're in crisis, anger's always gonna be there. So a phrase I used over and over and over, which worked really well, was you sound angry. And it would be putting a label on their negative emotion and they would bring them down really fast. So about the same time frame, I'm in a conversation with a woman who's now the ex Mrs. Voss. And we were discussing an issue that became one of the central reasons why she's now happily the ex Mrs. Voss. And so what, and she was angry. So what do you think I said? You sound angry. Now I can see the looks and some of the women in the, in, the, in the audience going like, nah, it's not gonna work. I go, you sound angry, and she blew up. I mean, rah, 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 rah. and I, re I remember in the moment thinking like, oh, ah, I'm a hostage negotiator. This usually works. What's going wrong? Well, the, the adaptation, because I'm labeling her anger as if I was an innocent third party. On the hotline, I am. And that's why I can get away with that. So, how does that empathy is about how the other person sees you? The, the correct approach would have been clearly, you're angry with me. That's the change. And that would have caused less of a negative reaction. And, but she wants me to know, and not only is she angry, she, she wants me to accept and bear some responsibility for contributing to that anger. Empathy is about how does the other person see it. And the closer you are to somebody, sometimes the more you might disagree with how they see it. So the labels might need to be adapted in the moment to how the person sees you. And then it gets you a little bit out of the maybe the repetitive nature, or not necessarily repetitive, but how do they see it in the moment? Was there any? Was there anything else? You you had two questions. Yeah. Oh, so, the second one was oh the thought shaping question. Yeah. Right. All right. So um, first of all, the only questions that we ask in general terms are what, how, and sometimes why. People love to be asked what. People love to be asked how. Rarely use why. It's a surgical emotional intelligence strike. Mostly a bad thing to ask somebody. You can change your whys to what. Instead of why you want that, say what makes you want that. And they'll give you a better answer. So principally how and what. The word what identifies obstacles. What stands in our way. That's designed primarily to find obstacles. What's the biggest challenge you face? One of Jim Camp's favorite questions from his book, Start With No. How is primarily for implementation? How would you like to proceed? How are we gonna get around that? That follows after you identify the obstacles, you wanna collaborate with how you're gonna deal with it. Now, this gentleman obviously has been studying the black swan method and he's probably disappointed because he started out by asking me a no-oriented question. Right? He's trying to, you're trying to black swan me a little bit here while we're here? Huh? Is that what you're doing? Because he knows it's more effective to get somebody to say no than yes. And he knows that we shift all our questions from yes to no. The thought-shaping question came up because not just asking how or what, but understanding the emotional response somebody's going to have before they answer. And my son came up with it in a hotel because he wanted a free upgrade to a suite. And he knows if he asks for a free suite upgrade, the person giving it to him is going to worry about getting in trouble. So he says to her, how much trouble do I get you in if I ask you for a free upgrade to a suite? So before she can answer that, she has to decide whether or not she can deal with that problem. And being warned ahead of time makes her go like, you know what, fine, I'll look. I asked a hotel 
um, as work. Uh, name, you know, whatever the term is for the person who receptions me on the desk one time. How much trouble am I going to get you in to ask you for a free, sweet upgrade? His colleague was standing there. He goes, that's okay. I'll give it to you and blame him. And it's really interesting how people react if you give them a chance to consider an emotion, especially a negative emotion, and choose to deactivate it or not before they proceed. Also looking at what we're talking about, if we look at the world today, I mean, with all whether it's you know we won't go into politics, but just looking at how different conflicts can you know pursue during a long period of time, what would be your advice or recommendation or maybe even a solution-oriented uh, insight on how how do we really solve the kind of um, conflicts, wars, I mean, I don't need to specifically mention everything that's going on, but, but what is sort of needed? Because obviously th there needs to be a sense of negotiation um, if we're really going to create, you know, the environment, whether it's in a corporation, a business, or, or in countries. You know, I don't know what percentage of it can simply be deactivated by people being heard, but a significant amount of it is deactivated by simply being heard. So I'm going to see if I can, your choice of violence, regardless of whether or not your government, your ethnicity, you're a, a group that feels aggrieved, you feel aggrieved because you haven't been hurt. I mean, violence is an escalation for people not having a voice. So am I going to make them feel heard? Is that, is that going to curb all violent choices? No. But it's going to curb enough that maybe we can get into a collaborative decision-making process. We both can discover a better outcome today, absent violence. People don't go to violence first. They go to it when other things that they've tried haven't worked. Because they tried to get collaboration. They tried to get a sense of being treated fairly. They try to get a sense of being involved in the process. So if we can take a step back, make people feel, feel heard and show the world that the collaboration, it doesn't matter to me how many violent choices that have been made that that will take away. All I know, it's enough. So the opening is to demonstrate understanding to see how much violence will just go away, not all of it, but just enough to find out how much is going to be solved by just letting people know that you're going to collaborate with them. So regardless of the conflicts, Let's talk about what your perspective is. If I take your perspective, I'm going to be enlightened and I'm going to think better. And then the possibility of seeing an outcome that works for both of us increases. Does it work every time? Of course not. Nothing works every time. This just works enough that it's worth trying. Have you ever thought of actually going into the conflicts and, and being, you know, the, the worldly conflict negotiator with all the old, you know, political realm between wars, between entities? Would they need people like you? Those discussions are occurring, but I'm very, very expensive. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. Now, I just wanted to see, would it be possible? I know that I have some people here who, after you were here this morning, who said, oh, do you think there's a possibility to experience assimilation, you know, like you do in, in Masterclass? Is there anything we can do sort of interactively with the audience that we could... I'd be happy to. Yeah? So so what would be interesting? Would someone like to partake in that? Not everybody. I knew you. You and, and the other one. Yes, in the middle there, because you were the one who also asked about it. So can, can, can we do something there? Sure. Okay. So how many do you need? One, two? Chris? I, two was, two, we'll see, yeah, two's fine. Yeah. Two? Okay, you and, and you. Let's see. And you'll all experience what a simulation is. Before we start, I just want to say thank you to this guy because he's a little ransom story and he saved a lot of money with a lot of negotiation. So before we start, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad it's making you prosper. Okay. So, 
Do you want to propose the situation? What do you want to do? So in his master class, the thing that shook me most was the negotiation on the salary. So you come to me for asking for a raise, and I you try to negotiate a raise with me, and I resist. And I think the good, and also, I mean. I'm negotiating a raise to the salary, so that's good, yeah? Okay, how would I negotiate a, a salary increase? Uh, if I was coming to you, how would I negotiate getting a raise? You, Is that what you want? Yeah, let's do it. You are the like, same thing as a masterclass. I don't know if you remember that, but you are a sales director, you want to become VP of sales, and you want a 20% raise. And I'm your boss. Okay, so, now, now what do I want? I want a raise, I want a, I want a promotion. Both. A raise and a promotion. Yeah. All right, so, it's going to be harder for him because I'm going to use an emotional intelligence approach. It's going to work if you're actually feeling the emotions. So we can, we can go through it, but it's going to be hard for him to react. All right, so, all right, so how can I be guaranteed to be involved in projects that are critical to the strategic future of this organization? You will be always involved in projects. They are strategic for us. And I don't know what you want to be involved in right now. Can you be more specific? Well, what's critical to you? What's most important to you? We just want to increase revenue and meet the targets. Okay, so here's the problem. That's why he's having trouble answering this theoretically. But you're running the company, you know what are your most important projects are. And, and we have a theoretical situation, so he's, he's having trouble answering that. But the point of me answering that to begin with, what she's open to, I'm not asking for something for me, I'm asking for something for us. And I'm asking for something for us that makes our future bright. Now human beings make up their minds on what decisions we think that we're making right now, how is that gonna impact our future? So by me asking that question, I've immediately shifted him to the positive goals that we're all working for. I didn't ask him for a raise, and I didn't ask him for a promotion. I asked him for something that's critical to everybody's strategic future, which now makes him see me differently, which begins to line me up for raises and promotions. Now your salary only pays your bills. Your salary does not build your career. You build your career and get promoted based on your accomplishments in a company or an organization that moves the whole organization forward. Now he could put me on these projects and not give me a promotion and not give me a raise. What happens then? I have a resume that's filled with accomplishments and I go shop myself out to the highest bidder because I'm a proven winner who does projects that move organizations forward, which makes me a valuable commodity. So I win one way or another. Now that question was given to me by a friend of mine that I went to high school with. I grew up in a small town in the Midwestern United States. Blue collar, not well connected, not highly educated, not wealthy families. And this friend of mine, same family, same social economic status, same everything. He's the head of an international bank. And everywhere he's gone, in every salary negotiation, every job negotiation, every annual review of his performance, that's the question he asked. And it has launched his career forward farther than anybody else I know. Now has he been in companies where they didn't like him, and they didn't promote him, and they didn't want him around? Yes. So it's no guarantee of success, it's just a guarantee, that question is a guarantee of best chance of success. Now hit one more point, let's flip it over. And if I say, where's my raise, where's my promotion, I start asking for stuff for me, how does he see me? Selfish. Stealing from me. What? It seems like you're stealing from me. Right. I, I, and the hard reality for every employee is that all of your colleagues 
or probably most of the time, when you go into the boss's office, you got your hand up. How do I get more for me, more for me? You, you don't go see the boss generally to say, what can I do for you? When's the last time you stopped in the boss's office and said, hey, just want to know what's bothering you, whatever, whatever's giving you a hard time, I'm here to help, let me have, let me take some stuff off your shoulders. Nobody says that. They walk in because somebody else got a raise, somebody else got a promotion, somebody else got a car, somebody got a trip, somebody got an expensive car. Why don't I get that? Unfortunately, most employees condition their bosses that the only time they come to see them is because they got their hand up. As soon as you start going in and saying, how do I help everybody? You are not different from everybody else. So that's the, sh the short, I, didn't, I know we didn't go through a lot of dialogue on that, but that's how you do the salary negotiation. Thank you. Thank you. Big names out there. Why 
Why not? And then tell us. Or they'll say, well, that's up to you to tell me. And that's when I know they're shopping. And they're not buying from me. And I need to know whether or not you're buying from me or whether you're shopping. But the why question is, is a powerful, creates this great human response. It's a global human response. It doesn't matter again what part of the world you're in, the word why triggers defense on us every time. So trigger into defending you. Excellent. Um, our president is a Harvard MBA. I'm the founder of the organization. Our president is an amazing woman. And she just told me, without knowing that I was going to come, she goes, we need to get this guy on board. We know you're very expensive, and we want you to. <laughs> I'm sure we can talk about it. Thanks. Yes, that there's been someone who's been wanting to ask something. Do you want, is it a simulation or a question? Okay, please, ask the question. Secondly, understanding how to say no politely. And we, we teach people to let out no a little at a time. And there's four ways to say no. And the first one starts with, how am I supposed to do that? Now, eight out of 10 times, that's gonna change everything in the world. Doesn't do it every time. Two out of 10 times, they're gonna say, that's your problem. You're gonna do it. That's why there's four ways to say no. The next one is, I'm sorry that doesn't work for me. You notice it's getting a little stronger each time. Each time you're getting closer to finally, if you gotta say no, you just look at somebody and go, no. You don't go, no! You go, no. Very matter of fact. But if you work your way back to that, Nobody that the Black Swan Group deals with is ever surprised or caught off guard when we refuse a deal. Because they've been seeing no coming from a little ways away. So we gradually let out no a little at a time. Now, if you're particularly happy, go lucky, and you seem vulnerable, Nick Nanton, the guy who financed, directed, and put together the documentary film, on a black swan group, which just got finished, we showed it here two nights ago. It's not released yet. Nick Nat is this bubbly, happy guy. I mean, like, he is bubbly and happy. Like, for, I mean, when I first met him, if, I, if he wasn't in a room of extremely successful entrepreneurs, I'd have thought this goofy guy could never get anything done. Now, people test Nick all the time because he seems like a pushover. And he's just really happy and smiles and he said, you know, I can completely understand why you want to do that. I can understand it's really important to you, but no. Because he knows he's so happy and smiling, he gets tested by the sharks all the time. And he doesn't change his demeanor. He just knows that some, the shark's going to come by and try to take a bite out of him. And that's just part of the magic of how he does business. And knowing it's coming, he rehearses in his head how he's going to stay bubbly and bright and happy and say no and not move an inch. And he's told me seven very specific conversations with some real sharks who tried to take advantage of him at the last moment 
You know, it's like the husband that hands the wife the prenup just before they get to the altar. A lot of business people do that. And Nick has had huge investments in projects where they tried to shake him down at the end for another 50 grand. And he says, no, you're buying. So, but he's rehearsed that in his head. So your job is to imagine with that same tone of voice and demeanor that people are attracted to, imagine saying no with that same demeanor. And if you can imagine yourself doing it, you will do it. But you gotta imagine yourself doing it first. So before we're rounding off, any more questions from the audience yet? Yeah, so we give you the chance to, to ask. Someone come with me. something wrong, the parent, the adult, the uncle, the neighbor, whoever it was, said, why did you do that? So wherever you are in the world, you got conditioned that if somebody says, why, you need to be worried that you did something wrong. And that's where I think most of the confusion becomes, because you need to find people's motivation. But I guarantee you that you're going to make them defensive, negative, dumber, when you ask somebody why. So the first switch is just, why to what? Say, so why do you want that? What makes you want that? What makes that a good idea? Switch your why's to what, and you're gonna eliminate a lot of friction in your communication. Switch your why to what, still have the same intention. Oh, so many hands flying up. Yes, there, there. Hi, Bruce, good question. Uh, it's more of a curiosity. I mean, have you ever uh, come across an incident where your deals or your negotiations uh, didn't kind of conclude and you hit a dead end kind of situation. More from a learning point of view, but uh, also as in those situations, what were the door options? Um, all right, so there's a variety of reasons that negotiation could hit a dead end. One of them is the deal was never ever there in the first place. And we use the proof of life concepts to try to sniff this out from the very beginning. And if you're really trying to genuinely find out whether there's an actual deal there or not, it has, it has a profile, there's a behavior that comes up over and over and over in your world. If you're open to it, you're going to see it early. And accept that it's not a sin to not get the deal, it's a sin to take a long time to not get the deal. So then secondly, if it hits impasse, 
probably due to lack of communication. And so India, we avoid impasses. Right? We don't have impasses. We don't have dead ends. We have walkaways. And you are always going to know what I want to make a great deal. I never want there to ever be any doubt in your mind what it would have taken to make a great deal with me. Now you're going to choose to accept or reject it, but I want to know for sure that you made that conscious decision and also decided that wasn't what you wanted. It might not work for you, and that's fine. But one of us is going to choose to walk away. I'm never going to let you walk away without knowing for sure, you know for sure what it is that I would have loved to have done with you. We, I, I don't know that we hit dead ends. We hit, we get in conversations all the time where we're just not going to accept the other side's terms. And that's fine too. Because we need a great long-term relationship. For that, we both need to thrive. If you thrive and I don't, I can't continue to do business with you. If I thrive and you don't, you can't continue to do business with me. So we're always looking for the best result for both sides, but we, we, we both do very well. That's kind of an indirect answer to your question. I, I, we really don't hit dead ends. I think a dead end is probably due to a misunderstanding. We, clarity, we, we, we crave clarity, but in a nice way. Hey Chris, uh, just a quick one here. Uh, reflecting on the previous conversation you were having about talking to your boss or your manager, and how no one really asks, like, you know, how are you? How can I help? How can I take a load off? If someone were to use that approach, would that come off as lying, or you know, would that trigger certain defenses, or as a manager, or you know, as a owner or CEO of your company, uh, would you just try your own approach? All right, so, um, and I oversimplified some of the following questions, how can I help? Because the critical aspect of that question is about strategic projects for the company's future. And I, how can I help? I need, my, I need my laundry to be picked up for my dry cleaner, that would help. That's not going to do me any good, strategically. Um, so, you know, your how can I get involved is in, in a really concise and direct area. Now, it only comes off as disingenuous if you don't mean it. Like if the other side asks, you gotta do it. So don't ask a how on anything unless it's your intention to follow through with whatever it is. How did I get on the hostage negotiation team in New York? I was completely, utterly unqualified. I was immediately rejected. But I asked her, you know, how can I get qualified? So what should I do? She told me to go volunteer on a suicide hotline. Never ask for advice from somebody you wouldn't trade places with. Never take direction from somebody who hasn't been where you're going. And follow through. So she said, go volunteer on a suicide hotline. It seemed obvious to me. Okay. I'll go volunteer. I went out and found a hotline, as it turned out, it was the one that she had volunteered on. I didn't go tell her about it day one. After I'd been there for five months, I came back to her and I said, I just want you to know I've been volunteering on a hotline for five months. She was shocked. I was shocked that she was shocked. Like she was surprised that I took her advice. She said, I tell everybody to do that. Nobody does it. Because people are always asking how to, how to do something, what should I do, and then ignoring the advice. That's when you're disingenuous. So if, you, if you're going to ask, uh, what do you want me to do, how do you want me to, how can I get involved, you got to meet it. you got to be prepared to follow through. So understand what you're asking and walk in there prepared to do what they, what they advise you to do. Okay, one last question, and then maybe Chris will be accessible later for questions, but yes.
from? That you adapt to get the results. Well, curiosity, which is, it's easier said than done. Curiosity, collaborative mindset is, is really at the forefront of what we want, uh, what I want. I'm not going to take a bad deal, so I'm not going to take myself hostage. There's no in my mind. There's nothing you can make me do, which means I can talk about anything because you can't make me do it. In a point of fact, that, that's reality. Anybody in this room, if you're in this room, people really can't make you do anything. I mean, you're doing pretty well. If, if you're in this conference and you spent the money to be here and the clothes that you are wearing, you have a, a degree of prosperity as it is. You can, you can make up your mind as to what you're going to do. Nobody can take your hostage other than you. There's a whole bunch of reasons why refusing bad deals accelerates your prosperity. That's a fairly long conversation. Now, if the tactic's not working, I'm not listening, or I'm not paying attention to the feedback that I'm being given. And maybe I'm determined to get you to collaborate by asking what or how questions, and it's not working. But I've got my ego invested in that approach. I'm not pivoting to another approach. I'm not using another way to get you to talk. So any of the given skills, I know from practice and application, it either me labeling you, or me using no oriented questions, or me using calibrated questions, one of those is going to open you up. If you're there to make a deal, and you might not be there to make a deal, or you might be there to only to exploit me. If I can't open you up and I can't trigger collaboration, I'm going to stop wasting my time because that's the most valuable commodity. And the more time I waste getting a bad deal, the more time it takes me away from good deals. We got some fairly good data to indicate that getting a bad deal takes two to five times as long as it takes to get a good deal, which means you just took a 50% cut of pain. And I don't like it that much. <laughs> well, we definitely made a good deal to be here and listen to you, Chris. And I must say, listening to this conversation, what I realize that the art of negotiation is so much entailed in the art of communication and is really the epicenter of being a human. It's just that we haven't really, society hasn't constructed, you know, a a, a structure for us to learn that as a capacity because everything we're talking about is innately in us but it's just that we're running a long life and we're not in tune with our feelings with our intuitions we don't really talk to people with our eyes we don't listen in and and, and just hearing you is i really hope that for one there will be you know the education of negotiation so that the kids at least can learn um, intuition empathy curiosity i.e negotiation and also that you will be out in the world negotiating with all the conflicts that we have at the moment because it really needs common sense and someone who comes from the approach from where you're coming from. And um, last but not least, I was just wondering, do you want to sort of leave a last key message with the audience that they can take a, a little wine nugget that they can take with them? It is with you, and that's what I love about what you just said. Every one of you in here, you have this capacity in you. And you might not have exercised it yet. You might feel like you can't learn it. There's an issue of learning new skills. It's referred to as neuroplasticity. Every human being at about age 25 forward, your ability to learn your neuroplasticity begins to go dormant. The key word is dormant. Not that it went away. You still have it in you. It is there, waiting to be woken up. If you don't see examples of it around you, the people around you are not practicing it, that contributes to it going dormant. But it's still there. You were born with it, and you still have it. All you have to do is let it wake up slowly. Don't pressure yourself to learn it quickly. What 
my colleague said, just get 1% better every day. One degree better, one tiny bit better every day. And you'll wake it up and you'll then one day wake up and be delighted. And how good you are. I say here, here, remember how unique you all are, each and every one of us. You know, so if we're going to appreciate someone else, we actually have to start with ourselves. So, I mean, do give yourself a few seconds of just appreciation that you're actually here on this planet. And that may be a soft skill, but it's definitely something we need more. So, I want to applaud all of you for also being here, for everything that you do in the world. And, you know, go out and be unique, to be compassionate and have empathy. And Chris, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I mean, it's affordable. And please check out Masterclass, because that is a way to leverage our own sense of negotiation. A big round of applause for Chris Moss. And with that, thank you all for attending the FinTech Search stage. Have a wonderful continuation of the Jitex Global, and the best of luck with all of you going forward. Thank you. Ahmad, Ahmad, brother, all done.